So today's talk is about trends in, in digital learning, or maybe more, Donna, about the trends that get discussed in various reports about trends in digital learning. So we'll, we'll get into the possible differences there, maybe. So there isn't going to be any PowerPoints or, or slides. This is going to be more of a kind of a free flowing uh, discussion. So happy to get um, inputs, really. And, and everyone attending is, uh, is, is very welcome to come in. But I'll get the ball rolling, maybe, as people are thinking about their questions and kind of get, adjusting themselves to, 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 to what's going on. And um, I, I was going to say, well, it, it's kind of a double question, really, in a way, uh, to, just to make things difficult for you. But the, the, the thing that gave us the idea for this talk, I suppose, was one particular report, the annual Horizon report, which, among other things, talks about current and future trends at that intersection of, of learning and technology. So you have some thoughts also about what that report actually says and, and how it meets or doesn't meet or takes into account or doesn't take into account the needs of, of staff and students on the ground, which is kind of the, the title of today's talk. So could you talk about those two points just for, for a moment quickly and say what the report is and how useful are how directly these trends, you know, fit maybe as you see it with the needs of staff or solve, solves actual problems that staff are having uh, as opposed to anything else? I will answer that question, but I want to just pull back a little bit and talk about the process that led us to read this report in the first place. Less people think that we're spending our leisure time sitting around reading the Educause reports. Um, the team at MTU, the MTU Tell team, has uh, started doing a regular series of um, reading sessions. Um, I've been calling it shut up and read. Um, some people might think that's a little rude. Um, maybe it's sit up and read. Um, maybe it's, you know, sit down and read. Anyway, we're, we're reading. It's really hard to get time to read things and talk about them. So we're trying collectively to give each other space to read and reflect and then think about the extent to which that thing we read is relevant to our experience or the experience of the people that we're working with. Um, so this was the, was it the first thing we read together? Yeah, I think it was. And um, when Garod and I said, let's read this as a team, we weren't necessarily thinking, um, this is a thing that we're gonna read that we're all gonna agree with. This isn't a thing that that is going to um, teach us things that we didn't already know, but it's a really visible artifact. The Educause report um, has a longer history than you might think because it used to be, and now I'm going to look at the history that I pulled up. Um, it, the, the Horizon report used to be um, put out by the New Media Consortium, the NMC. And so the Horizon reports actually go back to 2005 um, the NMC was acquired by Educause in February of 2018. So the 2019 Horizon Report was the first one that was produced by Educause um, all on its own. Um, and who Educause is as an organization is relevant to answering a part of your question, Garod, about you know, what even is the report and who is it for. This year, I wonder, is this year the first year? So they have some sub reports and the, they've started uh, doing things uh, that are teaching and learning editions, information security editions. So they used to do just like one great big horizon report and they've started producing them into sub reports. The one we read was the teaching and learning one, but Educause as an organization, and if anybody has been to the Educause meetings ever is um, directed at CIOs and IT professionals. And if you've ever been on the um, vendor floor at Educause, it is full of people selling things to the people on campus who have an awful lot of money. Um, and that um, institutional identity of Educause, I think, has a tremendous impact then on the kinds of things that they produce, the, the kinds of writing that they engage in, um, even as they are engaging with people from the sector. And you'll see if you look at the um, contributing authors 
and the uh, people who were consulted in the writing of this report, there are a lot of people on the ground working in instructional design, in education technology, um, but the primary authors, the ones who are in charge of what it looks like going out, are beholden to the agenda of EDUCAUSE, um, which is not necessarily the same agenda as those of us who are working in teaching and learning. Is that fair, Garod? No, I, th I think that's a fair summary, definitely. So uh, EDUCAUSE is, is a specific organization with its own interests and its own, and its own audience. Yeah, but yeah. the report itself has a, has a history that goes back uh, from from before the time of of Educause. but you saying that um, I suppose leads nicely on to that that second question I had I suppose about just maybe how you're kind of framing this talk in general you know so I haven't got it in front of me but it was something like you know digital learning trends from the ground up which I yeah. took to mean something along the line as I was saying earlier you know is this solutionism or you know are are the kind of things that vendors are saying or are we talking about trends that are really giving people things they need you know uh, bringing value bringing benefits solving problems for people um i don't know didn't know if you wanted to start there and then maybe we could talk about one or two of the individual trends or we can dive right in to yeah. the trends if that's easier so i would say that if you um those of you who are on the call if you look at previous um, Educause reports, you will see um, a great deal of continuity in the trends. There are things that they're calling trends in, in this report that they have been looking at as a trend. I don't know when a trend becomes just a thing that happens, um, what, the, what the dividing line is between practice and a trend. You know, what, who decides it's a trend? Um, is calling it a trend justification then for including it in the report? Um, according to whom, I think is a, is a question that, that comes up over and over again. Um, so yeah, we had picked sort of three major ones that we wanted to talk yeah, about. Yeah, I, 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 I can go into that. So just for everyone else's knowledge that, that, that we won't get through all of these trends, but the main trends I'm seeing in the report are AI and machine learning for, for two different purposes, for analytics and learning tools. The use of VR, AR, and XR, and whatever else you want to call all, the, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, new digital forms of accreditation and learning recognition. So that's primarily micro credentials and digital badges. And then the mainstreaming of hybrid or high flex uh, approaches. And maybe let me begin with that one because I think it's the most easy and maybe most conspicuous ones. There's an argument in the report, Donna, that says basically during the pandemics, uh, during the pandemic, singular, sorry, uh, during the pandemic, we, we, we reorganized our lives around online and remote modes of living and working, okay? So we discovered, or some people discovered for the first time perhaps, the benefits of being able to do things from quote marks, heavy quote marks, anywhere, okay? so. The, there's an argument that says that these practices will maybe persist to some degree, that that will be a big part of the legacy of COVID, not saying that we're finished with COVID yet. So, you know, we're, we're also in the, in the teaching and learning context here, I suppose, we're talking about the student as customer, maybe. Maybe the students will expect that they, they will have that continued kind of uh, flexibility, if you like, you know. So one obvious thing that's coming up here in MTU, for example, is the the notion that maybe we can have classes that would accommodate both on campus and online participants at the same time so i'm, I'm doing a class but people are tuning in um, at a distance perhaps and maybe those classes are getting recorded as well what, what what do we think of that one out of all the trends that seemed to me to be the most reasonable but i wasn't sure they were really engaging with some of the practical and operational um you know issues that 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 might exist there well and i know the rest of the team have things to say about the the hybrid thing so i would encourage people to either put stuff in the chat or um chime in um as and when you you think it's relevant but one of the things that struck me about the way that the educause report was positioning themselves in terms of hybrid and high flex and um the importance of online um, and digital options during the pandemic emergency 
was they were writing about the future of those options with a great deal of optimism. Um, and, and this I think is where their CIO focus is really revealed. Um, it reads like somebody trying to make an argument for continuing to have um, a lot of institutional support for a lot of um, online options and um, flexibility around either being in person on campus or elsewhere and still participating. But what I am seeing and what some of the rest of us have been saying we're seeing in terms of practice now in this term and even in the previous term was an awful lot of people in charge of universities saying things already like, we're gonna get back to campus, we're not gonna do online learning anymore, nobody's happy with having to be online all the time. The rhetoric of the people in charge of the money does not match the rhetoric of the people who are writing this report with a great deal of now everybody accepts that this is a thing that we need to do. And so we need to be ready to meet that desire. I think it's arguable that at an institutional level, that desire is supported. Now, that's very different from do students continue to need and want the flexibility, not just because of pandemic emergencies, but because there are students who have always needed and wanted this flexibility because of disability status, because of caregiving needs, um, because of uh, financial reasons, like they can't commute in, the price of petrol means that, you know, if they have to be in every day, doing a degree is, is not affordable. So that pre-existing need for flexibility persists, but the administrative argument for providing that flexibility seems to be fading away at the same time the EDUCAUSE is saying, this is great, everybody needs us now and they know they need us because of the pandemic. Um, this is the this phenomenon, the disconnect between what people doing education technology and, and IT in universities and what people in charge of the money are saying is what Peter Bryant at the University of Sydney Business School calls the snapback. And Peter's been writing about the snapback, that sort of back to normal rhetoric uh, since early 2021. He and I have been having conversations about it since 2020, that if we're not careful, there's gonna be a demand to go back to the way things were in some way because inertial force means that people want to go back to what was familiar. This way, this mode isn't familiar enough to enough people who are making decisions. And it's very, very tempting to go back to what's familiar. Absolutely, okay. I love that, the, the snap back, mm -hmm. definitely. There's another writer, Sheila McNeil, and I realize this is not gonna work for everyone, but uh, she did a blog post, it was a year ago now, and she compared the whole emergency remote teaching period to Bobby Ewing on Dallas. People of a certain age will recall, they wrote out this famous kind of soap opera star out of, out of a soap opera, didn't work out and they decided to pretend it had all just been a dream. So it sometimes seems like that whole emergency remote uh, teaching period was all just a dream and we we're being asked to pretend that it didn't happen and that we should just go back to the way uh, that, that things were. There's a few things coming in on chat. I don't know if people would prefer to come on the mic to make their, their points or are you, are you comfortable enough looking at them on, on the chat, Donna? Yeah, I was looking for a blog post that I wrote in 2020 about back to normal um, to that point. But yeah, there, um, Olivia uh, Flynn has said that you, there's part-time evening students who expect that things are going to be online. Um, and she's wondering if maybe, you know, a younger cohort might not have the same expectations. Um, I don't know that it's necessarily a younger or older thing because I've encountered, you know, young students who have life circumstances that mean that they need to take evening classes too, or they you know, need to um, live far away from the university and can't go in all the time. So you might have that need expressed more loudly by um, the more traditional looking, non-traditional student, right? A parent, somebody returning from the workforce. Um, but I, I think that this demand is more widely spread than some people might think it is because of the stereotypes we have of the first year full-time students 
Um, all of our students have complicated lives. Nothing, nothing is as simple. Um, and also, you know, we should be thinking about the most vulnerable students, not necessarily the most numerous students. There, there's an argument that if you do things that help the most vulnerable people, you are also going to be helping the people who maybe think they're fine, who, who maybe think they're all right. Providing flexibility gives you an opportunity to not have sick people in your classroom um, because they don't have to worry about catching up because you've recorded it or because there's a transcript or because maybe they're not well enough to be in the classroom, but they're well enough to participate in an, in an online environment. And the same is true for teaching. Um, Ruth uh, talks about, Ruth, do you wanna speak to this? This, this need for, for flexibility being built into sort of the way we do things? Yeah, I just, I just feel that, can everyone hear me first of all? I just feel that, um, you know, we've experienced this flexibility and we've seen benefits to the flexibility in terms of, you know, as you mentioned, if someone's sick, they can still get their coursework and attend the class, albeit not live. And, you know, there's students who are struggling right now in Ireland with accommodation and all around the world, they, they're struggling with accommodation. And they can't stay close to campus. So maybe there's a month where they're not able to be on campus because they can't find a rental and they won't miss any classes. Um, so I think it's been a very positive experience. We need to build that for the students. Um, and as you know, most students have part-time work to pay for their fees. I don't know any student of my friends who didn't work, and this just allows them to maybe generate some income while they are studying because it's more flexible. I find it really hard to argue against flexibility. I think that, and, and we've proven that we can be flexible. And so I, I think that, that part of I wonder if part of the argument against continuing to provide flexibility isn't primarily a financial one. The, this kind of flexibility requires resources. It requires staffing. Um, you can't just throw content online and have that be education. This is something that those of us who have been dealing with online um, and digitally enhanced education have known for a very long time. Um, it doesn't take less work to do this stuff just because you're not doing it in the classroom. Sometimes it takes more work. So there are labor implications and, and, and financial implications for this. But if we're making, as we often do, education decisions based on um, what the budget will allow, then we're gonna lose things. And I think one of the problems in rolling it back is that students witnessed what was possible. Um, I've heard, and read uh, things from uh, disabled students in particular who have been begging for this kind of flexibility for decades. And to see that flexibility being offered to everyone because there was no other choice was devastating because they said, well, I see now what could have happened if you cared that much about disabled students. Um, and, and the snapback is saying to them, now that not all of us need this, you don't get it anymore. And, and as I said, that's, that's no way to value the people in our community. Uh, Mary Burke is asking about comparative research on academic attainment. I think we've got pre-existing research. Yep. On the impact. Garo, do you want to speak to that? Sorry, yeah, yeah. Uh, people might not be aware, but I mean, there's something called the no significant difference phenomenon, and there's an associated website with this. Um, basically, gathering together, I think it might be up to 400 research studies at this stage, uh, comparing the kind of um, learning outcomes or the pedagogical effectiveness of different ways of doing teaching and learning different different kind of modalities and there are no differences really or are the the differences where they exist are down to the pedagogical approaches that are taken more so than the technologies or the or the modalities uh, that, that that are that are used uh, that might sound like a, i don't know bad news for one side or the other but i mean when you take into account that delivering online or doing digital learning you know adds all of this extra flexibility and independence of time and space i think maybe it rather puts it ahead i guess depending on the, 
on the cohort and the extent to which they would you know benefit from not having to commit if you like to coming to a bricks and mortar campus jane wanted to say something jane do you want to just shut up i'm just gonna come in with a counter argument i think you're absolutely right with all the advantages and flexibility of the online but also for some vulnerable students it's safer and more inclusive for them to be on campus so being on campus might be catering to them and is there a danger that trying to provide hybrid you need slightly different skills for providing online and for campus so how do you manage that that mix one thing we didn't do was define what we mean by hybrid <laughs> and i and i think this was another part of the conversation that we had you know what do we even mean by hybrid um and um other people may have different approaches but what i tend to mean um, by hybrid is a very broad like umbrella. Some things are happening online and some things are happening in the classroom and you can talk about it across a program or you can talk about it across a class or you can talk about it, you know, across um, a, a semester. So sometimes if I'm teaching hybrid, that means some days we're entirely online and some days we're physically in a room. Uh, sometimes when I'm teaching hybrid, um, it means that I am in a room, but I am um, recording everything so that it can be, be put online so that the people who can't be in the room can still participate in the class. Um, Garode, what are some other ways that that looks um, in terms of, of hybrid? Yeah, I suppose another one is giving the students the ultimate choice, really, which perhaps is, is, is the hardest one to, to, to support. Um, some definitions, well, the main definition that I suppose of high flex, Shane would probably be better placed to comment on this than I would, but would include notions of, uh, of asynchronous uh, digital learning as well, you know. Um, I guess mostly when I say hybrid or when I think of hybrid, I mean, this is one of the big issues, just as an aside, sorry, that, that, that we have to cope with in, in the whole digital learning area, you really have to when you're sitting down with people and having a conversation with them, you need to make sure you're both talking about the same thing, because there's a lot of terms that are just kind of thrown around there. For me, though, hybrid is the simpler kind of or the more gettable thing of having students who are maybe in class with you, like on campus, and simultaneously having students who are able to tune in at a distance. But it's something more ideally than just lecture capture. There's some notion that you're giving both groups um, a similar experience and similar opportunities, let's say, in terms of interaction and uh, and engagement. That, that's just a personal view, though. I don't know if that's helpful. Well, and I personally would not teach that way if I did not have a co-instructor. So I know that, that one of the main challenges of, of that kind of uh, simultaneous hybrid teaching is that it's very difficult to give sufficient attention to both groups of students. And we've seen this in events, right? If we have uh, people online and people in the room, you have to have people who are assigned to take care of those folks. So if I were a lecturer and I were told, you're gonna have a group of students online and you're gonna have a group of students in the room and you're gonna teach them at the same time, I would say, I need a teaching assistant so that they can pay attention to you know, one group or the other, I would probably point them at the online students and say, flag for me when they need to hear from me speaking to them directly. Um, because I, I, and I know people do it. I know people are told you must do it this way, but I think again, this, you know, this is a labor problem um, and, and demanding that individual people divide their attention that way is not fair to the students. And it's also not fair to the lecturer who, I mean, that's, that's just a well, lot. Who already has enough to be doing, maybe. Yeah. Uh, maybe last point on this to Shane, if you want to come in there, Shane, and then we'll, we'll maybe take another trend because we'll just spend the whole talk about hybrid if we're not careful. Sure, yeah. So uh, uh, just on, on that last point that Donna was making around uh, a teaching assistant or, or someone to help you, I totally agree there because, you know, it, it is very hard. Your, your, your attention is going to be divided. We've done a lot of piloting of of hybrid solutions here in in uh, NTU and you know even if the technology is absolutely seamless and really user friendly it's so hard to keep that um, concentration when you have that 
you know online audience and the you're getting all of these visual cues from your your students in the classroom as well but the big the key there really is to join up those two audiences so to plan that plan those types of interactions that connect those two audiences so you know polling and and little exercises that happen that join them up questioning the the students uh, throughout you know but the big thing i suppose in terms of of hybrid and i could just mention it there in a, a comment uh, towards the end was um i suppose back to your comment about that snap back to face to face donna you know the the snap back to what is very comfortable for people is the face-to-face -face, uh, classroom, you know, and that has its own implications in terms of putting pressure on our, our timetabling systems, our, our campuses are, are actually getting overcrowded because we have lots of students, not as much space really as we'd like. Um, you have also, as, as you're pointing out, those added pressures in terms of travel and, and everything else, but um, what it really does need, if if one was to look at at hybrid as as an option, is a kind of a long term strategy, and that would mean looking at our existing classroom spaces. Because if even if you look at our say for example in Cork here, we have so many different classroom types. Uh, you know, each has different capacity numbers. You know, you have different technology configurations it would really take a bit of long-term planning to, to seriously look at this but it would genuinely genuinely provide some flexibility to our students um, maybe it's something we look at even in you know semester two onwards potentially and you know some pilots and things but you know there, there is real opportunity I, I really believe that in terms of a more flexible delivery uh, but, you know, as as back to your last point, Donna, it, it does require resources. It requires the maybe the assistance within the the, uh, the room, the training, I suppose, to get those people up to, to speed and make sure that they're able to deliver those those sessions and also the technology to be in place. I would just add one thing to that. I think that we are justifiably concerned about is this serving our students well and are we doing the right kind of teaching and I think that it would be useful to have that kind of scrutiny put to and I was saying this um, earlier today to the group in the room we make a lot of assumptions about what effective education is and the fact is that we don't scrutinize traditional lectures in the same way that we scrutinize uh, digitally enhanced education active learning techniques you know these things that have a lot of research behind them that says they're at least as good as traditional ways and sometimes better. So I think it, it might be also be useful to push back against the idea that just because students are in a room with professors and, and teachers that they are necessarily learning um, in the way that we imagine they might be. Yeah, I think that that's a great point. I think the traditional face-to-face -face is often uh, held up as being a uh, you know a kind of a gold standard if you like that that maybe doesn't have to prove itself uh, Olivia did you want to come in do you want to make a comment yeah hi there thanks uh, Gerard um, I, I just wanted to comment I suppose on the fact of face to face it isn't only really about being face to face with your lecture it's about with being with your peers and you know the ability of the students to learn from each other as well so I think that's a big element that they turn to to lose out on. I mean, we can use the breakout rooms and all that, and it, it, it is great facility, and I use it a good bit myself, but to actually be in person with the other students, that's something that it's very hard to replicate online. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And, and that's probably one of the most challenging things to do when you're, when you're offering a, a course online is to create a, a sort of a, a space for peer learning, peer communication and collaboration and have a vibrant online uh, learning community. But when it works, it works. Uh, it works. It works really well. I'm sure Don has something else to say there, but I'm going to at least get two trends done before uh, before we finish up. So the second one I had listed here was the whole micro credentials thing. So this isn't just the horizon report people. This is loads of people. Micro credentials appears across a whole range of different uh, reports and forecasts. So micro credentials and digital badges. So what the difference is between those two terms has changed over time. And now, like many of the other things we've just been talking about, um, it depends on, on 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 who you read and who you're talking to. But in 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 MTU at least, I think we're beginning to think of micro credentials as being credit bearing, 
and digital badges as being non-credit bearing. And we know that both are interesting at least and have potential at least as ways to recognize learning in a more granular format, let's say, than we usually do with like our, our major degrees or major awards. But the Horizon Report, Donna, suggests, in fact, that micro-credentials, it goes a step further and suggests micro-credentials might now be positioned to take over from traditional third-level college degrees as the most common and even the most preferred form of post-secondary um, education. Is that a bit of an overreach? I mean... Your thoughts are welcome. Well, I mean, again, in the in the original discussion we had on the team, and I think it was it was Ruth who who made the decision. She said, you know, having been on the the job market recently, Ruth, I'm putting words in your mouth. You need to tell me if this is what you said. There wasn't a single place that she applied to that wanted um, not a degree. You know, there the if you had micro credentials, maybe that was like an additional thing. But you if you they wanted a master's degree. They wanted a bachelor's degree. They wanted these traditional credentials. And so, again, in, in reading this section, who is Educause talking to when they say micro credentials are going to be a huge deal and they're going to be really important to employers? But but the experience that that, that we have is that employers, you know, at least at the point of hire are not saying, if you have all these micro-credentials, that's as good as a degree in X. Um, I think there's a separate conversation to be had about continuing professional development and the kinds of things that employers want to see in terms of you know, continuing um, acquisition of skills and, and you know, reskilling and having new things. But one of my questions is, when did we give up collectively on the idea that employers are responsible to their employees for giving them opportunities to train and learn and apprentice within the organization that they are employed by. Although micro-credentials might be part of that if they're doing it, but I see Tom has his hand up. Uh, Tom, do you want to come in? Hi, uh, <clears throat> yeah, thanks very much. No, as I said there, I think we're in that sort of ambiguous position. and. One of the, I won't even go as far to call it research, a sort of a, a questioning hobby I have from time to time. I look at a lot of um, job adverts in, in third level colleges because I'm really interested in deconstructing what third level colleges say and what they actually do. So they talk about, you know, we don't open this and micro credentials and all this stuff. But yeah, if you, exactly as Ruth said, if you're looking for a job to get, you know, tenure above the bar, senior positions, they want the stuff like peer review journals and high impact journals and bringing in the money. They don't want, you know, buy one, get one free, 300 stickers, you know. So I think, you know, forgive me if I'm sounding a little bit facetious, but I do think when you see stuff like the edgy cause, and, and, that, and that's the thing, Ruth's experience is quite right. That's what they're, they're, they're going to be looking for. And I think as long as we you know, don't have a situation where there's actually a, a a wallet, if you if you wish, that you could actually carry around and it's portable and it's transferable and above all else, is regarded as having value. I mean, if I could spend beer mats in a pub and the barman will accept them, then they become beer mats become money, and that's I think you know at the moment my cred credentials are just beer mats. That's me. I now I want a beer mat the micro credential on the. The beer mat. I, I think one of the things that we talked about in our original discussion was who is asking for this, right? And, and one thing that occurs to me is, you know, what kind of systems contain or um, curate or communicate micro-credentials? And is this a case where somebody who's selling a system for micro-credentialing is talking to Educause and saying, this is it, this is the way, this is how we're going to signal that people know what they're doing in the future at some moment. And, and I, I want to know what the motivations are for that, because it seems to me that you can signal specialization in particular kinds of things under the umbrella of a regular old degree. If you get a degree in computer science, but you specialize in AI, as opposed to um, some other kind of computer science programming, you, you can signal that in the courses that you took, right? A course grade is a kind of micro-credential. How new 
how new is this, except in the sense that they're selling something to us? I don't know, am I almost forced to play the role of, of devil's advocate here, but I'll, 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 I'll maybe say two thoughts we have about digital uh, badges and micro-credentials. One is, I suppose, that digital badges, the non-credit bearing stuff, can be a useful way of recognizing, call it extracurricular and co-curricular learning. And it's a bit better than beer mats because there are these technical standards associated with digital badges, and that means there's metadata there, for example, that gives an indication of what somebody did to get the badge and, you know, um, maybe over time you know that learning evidence if you like can be used for other purposes and maybe badges can be stacked together or what have you you know uh, then with micro credentials i guess you know i'm thinking about it in the cpd context the credit bearing stuff and thinking about just with a business hat on of of offering qualifications in a much more granular format than we have done done previously maybe a bit more like for the kind of students that somebody referenced earlier yes. um, you know um people who've already got their degrees they're already professionals in the workplace but maybe there's some bit of learning some something that they want to get informed about that's somehow going to enhance or, or or add to you know whatever they're doing in their in their professional practice as opposed to qualifying them you yeah. know to, to take on a job in the first place but that that is really different from what educaz is saying in the report Educause is saying micro credentials are so powerful that it is inevitably going to result in the unbundling of traditional degrees into these things. And I, I don't buy it. I don't buy that argument. I, I think that, Garod, what you're talking about, the signaling of CPD and the kind of, you know, uh, certification and, you know, proof that I have done a thing such that it's recognizable even outside of the organization in which you did it. I, I think there is an argument for that. I mean, you you could again also say, or you could take people's word for it when they put something on a CV. You, to what extent is digital badging necessary when you could prove it a different way? I, it feels like a weird reskinning of something that maybe we didn't need. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anybody else want to, to come in? I think there's one or two. Uh, comments there in the in in the chat un unless either of those people want to come in and make their comments over the microphone are you happy making your way through it there donna i think yeah. the, co the comment that i was making is that you know at the moment we're busy working with industry to create a new masters but industry are saying we don't want our staff occupied for a year doing a master's it's going to be distracting it's going to be too much for them we'd like to as Garrett was saying stack those modules together to create a master's so i think it's more a case of viewing micro credentials as something that you're chunking the course and you can take it as long as you like and eventually you'll have a master's so i think micro credentials would be good as long as they're leading up to some form of formal qualification a bachelor's or a master's or whatever it is Excellent, excellent. And, and in that way, I think uh, you can think maybe of, of micro credentials as lighting the way for people as well. You know, maybe it's a it's a big thing taking on a 90 credit master's, but maybe we can light the way for people and say, look, you know, you, you've got one one batch or one micro credential already. You're, you're on the way. Follow the lights, you know, um, and you can stack these these together and, and, and cash in your chips, as it were, for 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 a major award at some stage. Jackie, did you want to come in? Yeah, I just said, um, just on, I suppose that comment on the digital badges, um, I suppose when, when we're hiring people, we check their LinkedIn profile, people, you know, in, in industry. And if you can put your digital badges there, that's, that's quick and easy for people to prove, okay, we've gotten this and you can look at the digital badge. Like we have some um, issues by TEL for our students. And it's there and people can see the skills because if you want to prove someone has a degree, they have to go back to the college and get the transcripts and you know, you can see what they've done. Um, somebody comes in and goes, they have a master's in cybersecurity in our case, 
And you go, what does that really mean? Well, if you actually study what are the specific subjects, you know, it can be harder for people that way. That's, that's why I like the digital badges. And like it is, people want to be able to take small chunks, not know, oh God, I'm going to be stuck in this for two years guaranteed and have nothing until the end of the two years, which is a problem. Um, you know, nothing provable to a, a recruitment person until the end of the two years. Yeah, of course, the two things are blurring now because uh, parchments, if you like, are being replaced with, uh, if you like, diploma supplements and other uh, digital formats like that. So uh, maybe in the end, there won't be that much of a difference between micro credentials and, uh, and traditional degrees. I know in a lot of traditional universities, they view micro credentials as just anything less than a major award. In our sector, we'd call them special purpose awards, but they they, they haven't had that uh, that that, that tradi hasn't traditionally been part of their of their of their DNA. Ashling, did you want to come in, or, or do you want us to just read through your comment there? Do you want to? No, I can do if you'd like. Or I, I just said there that I think that there's definitely a use for micro credentials, and particularly for certain niche topics that could be very clearly kind of defined into smaller bite-sized chunks. I think they're definitely beneficial and probably don't require a huge um, module, nor does it require a kind of a major award. But I think that the risk is always that students still have quite a traditionalist view of getting uh, an award as, as a string to their bow and kind of adding another master's degree or an undergraduate degree to their CV and um, to make them more employable. So sometimes if the offering is between something like a major award or maybe a grouping of micro credentials, you probably still in the in for the most part would see students opting for the more traditionalist award, I think for now. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think that's true. Now, um, we will try one more trend if that's okay. This one's really easy though. You'll get this one out of the way in no time. Uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Not a bother to you, but let me let me maybe set it up a little bit and say, obviously that's a major mega trend. It's meaning it's a trend that's really impacting or potentially impacting loads of different things. And we're all aware of things like uh, virtual assistants and self-driving cars and recommendation engines and chatbots and AI and computer games and, and, and so on. But how is all of this landing in the whole teaching and learning area? You and I have spoken before, for example, about you know the way vendors might vaguely gesture at AI as a thing that's going to solve a particular problem like obviously there's loads of subfields to AI and, and machine learning as well. Um, but do you want to just maybe give, give that give make that general point first before we dig into possible application or areas of deployment? Well, I, so Educause has two AI things, right? They have the AI for learning analytics and then they have the AI for, for what they call educational tools, which I am interpreting to mean like AI for grading, writing or something like that, you know, assessment located AI is one of the things that they're talking about, you know, having some AI do the marking of student essays and things like that. Um, but even before we get to the specifics of what Educause thinks that AI might could do, I think that it's useful as somebody who is not an AI researcher to ask pointed questions about who says what is AI, right? Who it would, uh, actual professional in AI recognize the things that ed tech vendors are claiming to be AI powered or AI potential. There's a lot of slippery language around AI in the ed tech space where they'll say the potential for AI to do this and this and this in this system. And it's never been clear to me if that is because we don't have an actually realized AI yet in, in these spaces any more than we have an actual self-driving car. So the extent to which we should base our policies um, and our decisions within institutions about some technology that is not fully realized yet um, feels weird to me. And I'm also worried about the impact of that imagining of what could happen on vulnerable students who are going to be possibly excessively surveilled, um, excessively you know, data capture from them in the name of developing this AI 
potential. I think the potential for AI to do X gets used as an argument to gather data that isn't necessarily going to benefit our students, but is perceived to benefit the development of the AI, if that makes sense. I already dove into it. I'm sorry. No, no, I think diving into it is good. And I think the analytics bit is very gettable, isn't it? So yeah. the, the argument here is that AI is going to help us get really rich uh, insights, or it's going to generate insights from the large amount of data that we have on our students about how they learn and why they learn and who they are and what the conditions are for uh, successful learning. And maybe we can reverse that and use that as a way then to recruit students. And there's, there's a lot of talk about what it could do and then lots of vendors indicating that they already have tools that can do these things. So the notion is, I guess already with, you know, people will be familiar with Canvas, we already have kind of descriptive statistics, if you like, that we can easily get at. Are we at a point where we can move away to more predictive analytics and then maybe more prescriptive analytics? And at what point does that does that get a bit uh, does that get a bit scary? Um, maybe just to skip on to, to Tom's point, I saw that article as well, Tom, do you want to give us a quick go on that? So in addition to all the concerns we have about essay mills and contract cheating, it turns out that your local friendly uh, artificial intelligence agent uh, might also be conscripted to write your college essay or, or, or college report. Yeah. Handing you over to our, our Kerry correspondent has, has more on this. No, I suppose you're sort of making the point there that, you know, we're allowed to use different facets of technology. Are, are, are we be, being sniffy about not allowing AI to write, write stuff? Uh, so, I mean, Eamon has been slightly provocative in, 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 in the title there like that. Um, and as I said, yeah, I mean, I think there was a, a, another article there and published new research. Um, so, yeah. I, I, oh, yeah, that one there, uh, Jim. Yeah, uh, that, that, that's a good one. If you want to come in and share that, I'd heard about that one myself. Um, I don't know about the AI. My favourite story, I, I often shared this, was it was a, a Northwest University professor and he used to have four or five hundred students and he'd have ten teaching assistants. And one at a time, he replaced it. Well, not didn't replace, but he had an additional teaching assistant, uh, which basically was a Twitter bot. But um, it was so responsive. I had a, a name and an image and all, but um, it was nominated for a teaching award because it always responded at all hours, day and night, and, and you know, and it actually became quite clever as it as, as it went on there. But um, yeah, as, as I said, like. It is. It's taking the whole essay mill to another level. And as I said, if we have all sorts of tools, I mean, I've heard people sort of just say Grammarly is starting to to cheat, you know. And as I said, so you know, because it's making suggestions. So, at what I, I suppose the thing about it is, if we have these tools now, do we have basically do we have a nineteenth century or early twentieth century morality about using ed tech tools rather than embracing it? I know you didn't say. I know you didn't sign up for a philosophical discussion. Here. No, so I think there's a real difference though between tools that have machine learning that can massage language so that it is, you know, a step along from what you're originally doing, right? So, so we could have a discussion about, you know, how how do you use machine learning or natural language processing to facilitate people who need help with language to get further on or something like that. You know, there, I. I I don't think it's just a philosophical discussion. I think there's a practical, what role could these tools have play in teaching people to write, right? We need to teach people to write if we want them to write in academic language. There, there are things that we need to do um, institutionally and individually as educators to teach students how to do these things. We cannot expect them to show up and be capable of doing them without taking on the responsibility for doing it ourselves. We don't get to argue that the schools should be doing this and they should already know how to do this when they get to university. We have a responsible responsibility to teach students these skills. That's, that said, I, I think that the, the churn around AI, right? Is, is a robot going to write the essays that my students are giving me? Or um, is, is there gonna be some replacement of me as a teacher by a chatbot, right? I think these are less 
um, evidence that that is a good way to go and more evidence that there is something happening around the devaluing of the human labor of education. Um, the idea that you could even speculate that um, a so-called artificial intelligence can be a good substitute for an actual relationship between an instructor and a student is something that I think bears um, a lot of um, reflection. I put the Washington Post link in because just before this meeting, I was reading this article about, I don't know if any of you have been following, the, the huge cheating scandal in, in chess and the 19-year-old the chess player who's been accused of using um, machine learning and AI uh, as a way of cheating and you know getting to the next best thing without actually using his brain. And some of the chess um, professionals who were commenting on it are saying things like, you know, um, just because you can use algorithms to make your game perfect doesn't make you a good chess player. Like they're, they're valuing this sort of messy, weird leaps that the human brain makes, even if they're not, you know, optimized in a computer sense. Um, and I think it's possible that we need to start making that argument when people start talking about the potential of AI to do X, Y, and Z. We need to make more arguments benefiting the sort of wild, woolly, and unpredictable synapse-based ways that, that humans come to knowledge and not have it be smoothed out and idealized um, in a way that, that machine learning, whether we call it AI or not, can do. Sorry, somebody else should say something. Well, I, I thought it was interesting what Tom was saying earlier that maybe the likes of Grammar, Grammarly and getting an AI to write your essay are obviously not the same thing, but maybe on the same continuum, you know? And it made me think about how, you know, a lot of contract cheating sites present themselves as just providing services and supports for students. They don't say, hey, welcome to our cheating website. They say, would you like some help writing your essay or what have you? I mean, um, I, I, I don't have an answer. I think the chatbot thing is interesting. I think that's what we're, we're all going to start experiencing first in terms of AI landing in the digital uh, learning area. Uh, I haven't had any um, particularly pleasant or enjoyable experiences with chatbots. I, I don't know. I was know. just going to say, when, would, when did you find an actually useful chatbot? When did you find a chatbot that could give you information that you couldn't just Google off of the website of whatever it is you were trying to learn from? Um, I, I keep trying to ask my bank chatbots complicated questions and they, um, they say, or even not so complicated questions, you know, how do I get access to my account if you shut it off because I'm traveling? And the little chatbot says, I can't answer that. Can you ask me something I can answer? <laughs> so there maybe is an example of, you know, something being more motivated by the vendors let's say than the end users i don't think end users are crying out for for chatbots i mean we'd all be happy if they got to the, the, the a stage of kind of fidelity or what, what have you whereby it felt like you were talking to a human and they could deal with those kinds of uh, questions but i don't think we're we're there yet speaking of not being there yet it's a minute to the hour so that flew by but thankfully we sorted out ai and machine learning we've got that all sorted yeah <laughs> so uh look it just remains for me to thank uh, donna thank uh, all the contributors and thank everybody for coming along really thanks so much we must do it again yes thanks for being here and witnessing and participating in the conversation i appreciate it